Hello everyone and welcome back to Phoenix Gaming. I'm Nick Henning, I'm your host, and we are here today to talk a little bit more about my philosophical approach to games. Um, hopefully teaching you not just kind of my thoughts about specific games, but sort of how I approach games in general. I did do another video about grand evaluation theory with Lost Ruins of Arnak, where I talked a little bit more about the history of why I'm doing this. I am in this video essentially going to run again through what this theory is and then apply it to Wingspan to show you essentially how I have you know, started to consider crunch the numbers in that game and how you can be looking at numbers in that game um, to to help you just kind of get a leg up on your opponents and and un, have a sense of what's good, what's bad, what's powerful, what's not. Um, grand evaluation theory is this imaginary thing that I made up that sort of in every game, um, particularly in Euro style games, asks the question of what is the base resource? How does everything relate to that resource or to one another? Um, generally, this kind of theory works best, again, like I said, for Euro style games, although it does apply to other things. It's generally best in games with one or mo with more than one resource, games with just one resource like Azul is the example I used in the previous ones, kind of closer to an abstract game. You just take tiles and score points. There's not a lot to necessarily juggle. You're not trying to consider relative power across different things, different actions, different rewards. So we're looking to do that. We wanna understand what income or output looks like. Um, and we're trying to get a sense of what's, what is what is good, what is bad uh, in, in a game. Generally, these kinds of uh, numbers that we're going to be crafting here give you a sense of raw power, but they don't consider context. Most good game designs challenge you to consider the context. Um, they make essentially the core components roughly equal in strength, but then when we get into, hey, this is good now, or this is good for you, um, that's actually why I chose Wingspan as the second one, because all told, a lot of the things are quite balanced amongst each other um, with with some notable exceptions and you can tell very obviously why from this grand evaluation theory idea um, but they also are very different based on your context and so good wingspan gameplay says what do I have going on and is this bird's power relevant in this moment or not the other thing is that um, and again, this, this is helpful for Wingspan, is understanding these base resources can open up avenues of pot, uh, like possible exploitation benefits that you are getting um, in a way that sort of break the math a little bit of what the game designer had maybe originally intended along the way. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and talk about Wingspan. Let's pull up our base board here um, because this is actually going to teach us almost everything we need to know the three, there's four actions you can take in this game. Play a bird, gain food, lay eggs, and draw bird cards. And if you have not played any birds, then you can get one food, two eggs, or one card. Now, offhand, I would say that this means that one food is worth one card is worth two eggs. And that will wind up actually being incorrect. We need to end up looking at bird cards and sort of um, what that is to understand why there's an error there. In fact, I think this game treats one egg like one card, like one, um, like one food. And what that means is that by default, taking the middle row action is the best value at the beginning of the game. The problem is... Food lets you play more birds, cards let you play more birds, and eggs, eh, they sort of let you play more birds, but mostly they're just a hurdle to get by. They largely don't do anything. They score points at the end of the game, but when we start looking through birds, we'll see that each of these are valued sort of equivalently with each other, one, one, and one um, across them, and also one to, to each point. And so this is the first part about context in Wingspan, that becomes really, really important for us to understand. At the beginning of the game, food and cards are way more important than eggs. On the last turn of the game, drawing more food and more cards are generally horrible. They don't do anything for you, um, whereas eggs are strictly points. Also, if we look at the board as we move along the board, putting one bird into play, covering up this spot, means that we don't get any more resources. We get a resource and a potential trade of a thing that we said was one to one, right? We think a card is worth a, um, a die. Okay, putting a second bird gives us a whole other resource. So two birds gives us a resource, one bird gives us 
a resource and an option. We could maybe argue that this is valued at one and a half, which means that every bird in play is going to increase the value of our food action by like a half maybe? I don't know if you'd want to view it that way. I like viewing it that way because I like nice linear numbers. I think more realistically, like we would call this as an action worth one. This is an action worth like 1.1 and this is an action worth two realistically. But if you want to call it one and a half, you're welcome to. Again, this depends a lot on your context. If you have found a way to draw tons and tons of cards, then this is probably worth closer to 1.8 or 1.9 because you don't care about that card you're discarding. You have excess cards. And this is the first part of Wingspan that I think does a really good job of asking you what's your context for what something matters. Everything follows this same progression. The first bird makes it so that your next action has an additional trade option. We think that this trade option by default in the game is really bad for eggs because we suck at getting food, but we're good at getting eggs. So this conversion of using a food to get an egg is not great unless you are some other way that you're getting tons and tons of food. But the second bird that goes here, now we're up to producing three at a time. And now relative to, to food, right? We're at a three to two ratio instead of a two to one ratio. These things are actually starting to narrow in on a similar um, level of power just for taking that base action there. So something weird is going on with eggs even just based on the board because these do not grow in a um, proportional linear scale. They just grow on a linear scale, all of them the exact same line, but it's not proportional uh, because eggs started off at two versus one. Okay, cards, same thing, one to one and a half to two. The reason I wanna talk about cards is because this action right here lets us convert an egg into a card. And we, remember, are really good at making eggs at the beginning of the game. And so for me, this was one of the fastest unlocks to understanding Wingspan, is that putting even one bird in the draw bird cards category right here means that we could then make some eggs and draw two cards at a clip instead of one card at a clip. And we're better at making eggs than we are at any of the other things. So in a lot of ways, I think the very first draw bird card you play is maybe the most important bird you play in the whole game. Let's look at some birds so I can prove my point about evaluation, how these things are a little bit confused and how I think most things are worth one. We're gonna focus on birds that have brown powers. Brown power birds essentially add one to whatever action you're doing, right? So actions start off at a value of one or we don't know if this is two one half values or two yet, but I'm gonna say that it's a value of two and this is a value of one itself. Every brown power we add is going to add roughly one to the strength of taking our actions. I'm not gonna talk about pink birds today. You already know they're good if you know this game. Um, I'm not gonna talk about uh, white birds either. Um, they, that could require its own like entire conversation and video, but because we're talking about this grand evaluation theory and comparing, the brown birds are very nice and easy to compare. So of course I cherry picked some to make my point, but you'll notice that the majority of the birds in this game do follow this pattern. The blue gray gnat catcher is a really, really great example of a bird that adds one. He just straight up adds one additional resource gained from the supply. So you just are always getting this worm. This is one of the best cards in the game that you can get at the beginning of the game, I think. Um, yes, it does not give you the, it's not as good as getting, you know, a die choice, right? Because it's always, always a worm. But worms are very, very prevalent in consumption throughout the game. So functionally, what this does is just add one food production to your food production process. Very nice, very clean. We can evaluate this bird against lots of other birds that do one thing. So the American coot and um, other tuckers like it have uh, an interesting dynamic in them. Tuck a card from your hand behind this bird, draw a new card. So a lot of people look at this and they're like, all right, well, that's zero. That's not anything. Um, but what you'll find is that actually tucking a card, if you don't know wingspan, is worth one point. So essentially one point to one card to one food resource, to one egg, is the pattern that we're gonna find across most of these birds. Tuck a card to draw a card also lets us get rid of our worst card and hopefully draw something more exciting. We could draw it from the face-up display if there's something we like or draw something random. Um, but the idea is that hopefully we're cycling to something exciting along the way and generate a point while doing it. So you could argue that this card is better than one because the that kind of like one core that we have a lot of these cards here 
is actually broken here because I get some filtering power, which is a net positive generally, um, as well as the one point that I've generated. You could argue that it's a negative. In order to do this, you must have cards in hand, right? There's a limitation that's there and you must have cards that you're at least willing to discard or permanently get rid of one of them. Something to consider. Now this bird specifically goes in the wetlands. So by definition, when you've taken the wetlands action, you will have drawn a card. So you don't have to worry about that limitation there, but these tuckers are not always in the wetlands. So um, just a thing worth noting for that context there. I really like these birds as an explanation of that value of one. This says discard a food in order to gain two cards and tuck it underneath this bird. So this says get two points by discarding a food to do so. So we see again, pay one, gain two is the same as gain one, but not a lot of people play this card and they don't play this card early in the game, certainly, because context matters, right? At the beginning of the game, usually you're collecting food so that you can play out more birds not so that you can pay to get some victory points that are only gonna matter at the end of the game. Unlike eggs, which actually even have a purpose in the middle of the game, they let you play more birds if you need um, you know, the eggs to, to discard for that, and they might score you end round bonuses, the American White Pelican here does none of that stuff. So in context, this bird is generating one, but at the beginning of the game, it's quite bad. And at the end of the game, it's actually very good because you might have food that you need to use and converting a food into two victory points is a huge increase in, um, in value and purpose. So context matters. Instead, let's look at a bird that's really, really clean. This is the cleanest example of scoring a point. When you trigger this bird, it just caches something from the supply on this bird. It's literally just score one point. Um, it's about as clean as it gets. Very, very cheap bird to play. Uh, and it's it's there's there's really no frills to it. Really great example. Here's another great example of a bird that does one thing. And this is how looking at bird cards is how I said, okay, we're not looking at two eggs to one food or two eggs to a card draw. Generally, birds that have egg actions lay one egg. Um, this bird is one of those examples. Uh, and you know. We're mostly talking about brown powers now, but part of the reason I picked this bird is to, to make a point. You know, the other birds that we've seen so far um, have one or two costs and, you know, they're worth a couple points on the left side next to that feather there is what it says is their, is their points. This one's only worth three points, but it can make upwards of six eggs, which is a good thing. It can house more eggs on it. The thing that makes this card a little bit special is that it can lay eggs in the forest. You can play in the forest and lay some eggs on it. And so, there is a value in this game in breaking um, breaking habitats, like which habitat you need to or don't need to go to. So this card becomes more unique, more special for that reason. The context of when and where you play this bird makes a difference in the course of your game. If you play it in the um, forest near the beginning of the game, well, you might not need to take that many lay actions in the middle of the game. And that might make your engine a little bit more efficient, even though this bird itself is not that um, special in terms of its raw power compared to these other birds that we've talked about. On the other hand, if you're playing this kind of mid or later, the fact that it costs three food and really is only generating that one power mm, might not be so worthwhile. Great Horned Owl here is an example of a card that scores one point. All of the hunters essentially try to score one point, but don't quite, right? Like look at a card, maybe if it's small enough, you get to tuck it. Um, the other ones are like roll some dice. Maybe if you roll correctly, you maybe get to cash something on this bird. All of the hunters have this example of, I almost score a point, but only if you're the right kind of lucky. And the great horned owl is especially good at hunting. It hunts pretty big birds because he's a badass himself. So it's almost always a point. Um, but this action is, you know, strictly worse than that Carolina chickadee, which just scores a point every single time. No questions asked, no ifs, ands, or buts. Of course, again, context, this bird's a little bit different because it costs a bunch of food that you may or may not have access to, but gives you a bunch of just raw victory points along the way. So just considering that sort of evaluation of everything it does one or one-ish, the power on this bird is bad um, in comparison, right? Everything else does one, this does less than one. So we don't like the power on this bird, but we do like that it's worth eight points and that's fine. Grand evaluation theory doesn't ask you to say, um, hey, I'm just gonna do the things that are efficient. It asks you to understand what sort of it's generating 
like input output resources and uh, uh, compares those things. This is another example of a bird that I think is quite hard to evaluate, but it follows the rule of one. It says gain one thing from the bird feeder if available. So first of all, it needs to be conditioned. It's these limitations, but you could argue that this is nicer than the original one I talked about, the blue gray gnat catcher, because I have now a choice of two different resources that I could pull from instead of just the one. I think that in reality, this bird is a little weaker than the gnat catcher. It's just harder to trigger. It's very expensive. And when you want food is you want it early. So ideally I want to have access to bonus food early, but having that bonus food early, if I can get this out at the beginning of the game, nice and very flexible as long as the bird feeder is giving me what I want. So this card is almost exactly like the great horned owl in that it is do the one thing if the situation works for it and it won't always. So that's important to realize. Then we get into birds that are arguably bad, at least bad for its power. So the Eastern Phoebe says all players gain one from the supply. There's no question that this is worse than the blue gray gnat catcher, um, unless you're trying to play cooperative wingspan. And that just means that by playing this card and activating its power, it is not doing as much as, in fact, you could argue that this is zero because increasing my stats by one and my opponent's stats by one is not worth anything. It gets more complicated than that in context because if I really need food but my opponents don't really need food, then actually this card is maybe worth one to me and worth only a half to them or really almost nothing to them. Maybe just tiebreaker to them because they have a gazillion food already anyway. Um, and, you know, for folks who want to understand why this bird is even playable in the first place, it can go in a lot of places. It's easy to play. It can lay eggs, and the eggs are wild eggs because they're um, in that star habitat. So you could see certainly why a person would play this bird card, but for its power, its power is quite bad. I like to compare that one to this one, the lazuli bunting. Um, or birds like this, which says everybody gets to lay an egg on this specific kind of bird. You can also lay an egg on a different one of these birds. These cards are really fun because I think people learn from like the, the prior bird that I talked about. They're like, oh, this is maybe not essentially giving me like the advantage that I'm sort of hoping to have in the course of the game. And then they fear this card, the lazuli bunting. But what it does is it gives you plus two and it gives your opponents plus one. And if you're able to break parity here by um, having your opponents not have birds that are, that are bull birds and you have the two bull birds that you need to make it work, then all of a sudden this card can be very, very exciting, right? Two for you, one for that person and nothing for you over there. Um, that could make this actually more than the average bird power. On the other hand, if you don't have a second bull bird, then this card is just everybody gets an egg that's a little bit more suspicious, right? Um, that suddenly becomes becomes quite weak. <clears throat> and then the last bird we're gonna talk about is uh, sort of one of the, the threatening, the so-called power four birds um, that sort of break parity in the game. And what's interesting about this bird is that on paper, it doesn't do anything egregious because on paper, it says discard an egg to gain two resources, pay one to gain two. That doesn't seem like it's necessarily a big problem. Um, but this and its ilk uh, are pretty busted in wingspan um, because of the issue of context. And the context here is that this guy goes into, let's move this back up, mm, display. You put this guy into our lay eggs habitat here. And now when we're taking the lay eggs action, we do need another bird to make it work, um, but just follow with me. I, even in just this weak scenario, lay two eggs and delay it on another bird, then I discard an egg in order to make two food. So essentially what happens is I've laid one egg and made two food with this action. Whereas if I had put a bird kind of in this top row here, even that gnat catcher that I said was really good, come along gnat catcher, right here, this is get two food, right? And this was get two food and an egg. Um, so because eggs produce at a more efficient rate, converting eggs into other resources tends to break the scale of this parity. And these birds that pay an egg to do two of something else 
um, are just far and away better than the other birds. They would not be uh, if egg laying started at one, one and a half, two, two and a half, you know, that kind of same progression that the other resources have. So wingspan has this interesting tension where it it doesn't quite agree on whether eggs are worth half or one. Um, and where you are in the game greatly changes what matters about what these things are being evaluated at. Um, whereas cards and uh, food both are functionally doing the same thing. They're getting you more stuff so that you could put more birds into play so that we can have these essentially bonus actions, bonus valuation along the way. That's basically the idea of how I'm applying evaluation theory to Wingspan to help me have a sense of what's good, what's bad, what birds do I like, what do I want to play, what don't I want to play. I hope that helped you a little bit. If you like this video series, let me know in the comments. I'm happy to apply this kind of concept to other things. Let me know what game you're you're curious about. I'm happy to take a look at it. I'll even learn a game I don't know and give it a shot. Who knows? Um, let's have fun with it. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a wonderful day. See you around.